The fog-shrouded sign on the Tennessee-North Carolina line shows Carver's Gap is a little over 5,500 feet high. But as I began my two-mile walk on the Appalachian Trail, it seems my steps get steeper and the air thinner. Following the footsteps trod by decades of hikers, I gradually ascend Roan Mountain through deep, quiet forest, which gives way to knee-high sage. Eventually, the trail opens onto the unique balls, revealing folds of mountains as far as I can see. The weather is iffy, but the view inspiring. Up here on top of Roan Mountain at about 6,000 feet, we've encountered what we pretty much knew all along. The weather can change in an instant. Down below, it's sunny and mild. Up here, the clouds have moved in, the wind's howling, it's damp, and it's chilly. No one knows how the balls were formed. These were rare ancient grasslands that were here before Europeans ever showed up. They represent a unique uh, natural community. Livestock replaced the mastodons and other wild beasts that once roamed this land. Many years down the road when the land was acquired and became part of the national forest, the livestock were removed from the mountain and replaced by today's invasive vegetation that's endangering the globally rare ecosystems found here. Which brings us to an old-fashioned solution to a growing problem. These angora goats have four-chambered stomachs. They eat a lot, and they love the plants that are threatening the balls. You can see this waist-to-chest-high blackberry thicket, as well as scattered green alder through here. So um, the first thing to even get the goats into this area is to start working on the fence line. Jamie Donaldson is a botanist who tends the goats for three months as part of what he calls humorously the botany project. If you look down at the ground, you'll see that the grasses and sedges are still here. The goats have a minimal impact on them compared to the woody plants. And that's the whole reason we're using goats for this purpose. 44 Angora goats and one milk goat are guarded by two Great Pyrenees dogs, Baxter and Bean. The goats chow down inside a solar-powered portable pen that covers slightly more than an acre. They'll eat about six acres of woody plants in a summer, covering the same areas twice. They process roughage that other animals can't survive on, so they eat things in bulk to get the equivalent energy. The goats are a family, and Jamie knows each one by its name or number. Hello, Sinpa Moonbeam. Uh, this is one of the fine ladies from Northern Virginia donated to our project. It's number 230. Very strong, dependable goat with some of the finer hair from the Virginia goats. Last year, that goat's name was Creviset, named for uh, three grandchildren, Christian, Evan, and Seth. The goats are helping pay for the project. Our funding so far has come from a North Carolina Appalachian Trail license plate grant program fund, uh, significant anonymous contributions, and then the Adopt-A-Goat program. If you adopt a goat, you're helping to support the project, provide for the goat's retirement plan, make sure they don't go off to the market. Um, you would get an adoption certificate, a picture, a lock of hair, and uh, the chance to name your goats. So that's what's gone on here. The first people that have claimed these goats, it's their names that I use um, for that summer. And if they keep adopting the goat, then I keep using their names. Hikers often slow down to take a good look at the goats. Bye, and visiting students are always fascinated by them. Oh, here's the little baby. Despite brief moments of asserting authority, the goats get along well, sharing a crucial mission, saving what remains of an incredibly rare habitat. About 75% of the historic balls on Roan Mountain have been lost to overgrowth. It's important to save the rest for future generations, even if it means one mouthful at a time. I'm Alan Griggs on Tennessee's Wild Side. <laughs>